Hey, welcome to Thursday Church. No matter where you're at this morning, we're just glad that you are with us. Last week, we talked about the importance of living out our mission statement. Our mission statement is this, if you know it, say it with me, where we're doing church differently while staying true to the message of Jesus Christ. More than ever, now is the time that we need to be staying on mission. Know the, know the mission, live the mission, love the mission that we are called to stay true to Jesus Christ. This morning, um, we are introducing our new sermon series we're going to be talking about for the next several weeks. And this particular series has a very fond place in the heart of one of our associate pastors, Pastor Jason. And um, it's because about a year ago, his then five-year-old daughter, Brenly, Brenly, give everybody a wave. <laughs> She was doing what children who've been churched do when they play. From time to time, they actually play church. And she was the pastor, believe it or not. And I don't know who she was preaching to. Could have been the dog, could have been her sisters, could have been her stuffed animals. But she's preaching up storm. And so, so Pastor Jason asks her, hey, Bryn, does your sermon have a title? He wanted to see how developed her, her little thought process was, and it did. This is what she said. Never tried to air zombies after talking. Now, if you don't do five-year-old, let me tell you what that was. Never plug your ears when Jesus is talking. She may have just been a five-year-old, but the intention was spot on. We do not turn a deaf ear to Jesus, no matter who we are. Whether we are five or 50 or 100, we don't turn a deaf ear. Not if we are calling ourselves a Christian. Not if we are saying we are a follower of Jesus. Every moment of our life, no matter where we're at in the process, is extremely important. And we are called to, to be listeners and learners at all points and time. Matthew 21 verses 15 through 17 states, and the leading priest and the teachers of the religious law saw these wonderful miracles and they heard the children in the temple shouting praises for the son of God, for, for the son of David. These children are recognizing who Jesus Christ is and they are offering their praise they, they are shouting, this is the Son of God. And, and the, the religious leaders are indignant. They are indignant. Verse 16, they ask Jesus, do you hear what these children are saying? In other words, Jesus, are you listening to what these children are saying about you? Are you hearing it? Do something about it is basically what they're saying. And Jesus says, haven't? You've read the scriptures? He's saying this to the leaders, the religious leaders, scholars who, who have studied the words of God, the commandments of God in depth. And Jesus is saying to them, haven't you ever read the scriptures? For they say, you have taught children and infants to give you praise and then he returned to Bethany where he stayed overnight. You have taught children and infants. In other words, God placed within the soul of a baby before a child can speak this ability to connect with him. This desire and this hunger is placed within us in our mother's womb. Get that, folks. Because we were created in the image of God. And so within us, the voice of God is placed within us so that we can commune with him. And these children, they get it. And the religious leaders were infuriated by it. And when Jesus said, haven't you read the scriptures? They were all well aware of what the psalmist had say, said, King David. They clearly knew, and he knew that they knew, that the words that they were saying, haven't you, haven't you, uh, or, or, or do you hear what these children are saying, that, that, that went totally against what they had been studying 
for years and years and years. Psalm 8, verses 1 and 2 says, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name. Your name fills all of the earth. Your glory is higher than the heavens. You have taught children and infants to tell of your strength, silencing your enemies and those who oppose you. The power of an innocent voice, a power, the power of, 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 of a child embracing truth is overwhelming. It's overwhelming because it's placed within them from the time of their, before their birth. So these leaders who are attacking the proclamation of these children, they recognize, they have to recognize that they are speaking against everything that they stand for, and yet it really bothered them that these children were so overjoyed. These were probably children from Bethany because that, that last line is added, uh, and then he returned to Bethany um, where, uh, where he stayed overnight. And, and he did this on multiple occasions through the course of three years. But this last week of his life, the children don't know this is the last week of, of the life of Jesus. The leaders don't know this is the last week. But, but Jesus knew. And, and he knew that that, that Thursday evening was going to change everything. And so as things were escalating in Jerusalem, because he's there teaching and he's preaching, and this is the last week of his life, so he's going to make sure that he says everything that he desires for those people to hear. But, but as things would escalate for his own safety, he would need to slip away. And he would slip away to Bethany because Bethany was a safe place. It was a place where they recognized who he was. And the children from Bethany would make their way, probably following Jesus, that, that, that following morning, following Jesus, and they'd make their way to the temple. And, and when they would see him, they were making sure everyone knew exactly who he was unashamedly. They were calling out, this is, this is the Messiah. They were not ashamed. What happens to us as, a, as adults? How do we lose that? What, what happens within us where, where, where as a child we are so unashamed and yet something changes when we become an adult? And, and, and the religious leaders of the day, they wanted this message silenced. And so when, when it was no longer safe for Jesus, he would make his way to, to Bethany. And, and these children were not ashamed to give him their praise. Uh, they were familiar with Jesus because many of them had witnessed with their own eyes. And here's how we know that. In this uh, first century, there were not, the, the term babysitter didn't exist. And so if your parents went somewhere, they drug the children with them. How many of you can relate to being drugged to church all the time as a child? Well, that, that, that is true for me from the get-go. My parents were bringing us to church. And so these children, they were going with their parents when, when the, the word came out that, that Jesus is speaking here or there. And, and they were able to witness these miraculous and amazing events of Jesus. They saw with their very own eyes the lame being healed, the deaf being made to hear, the blind to be able to see. And these children, many of these children would have thoroughly understood about the resurrection of the dead because Lazarus, this was his hometown. Bethany was his hometown. And not only had he died and was buried in a tomb for days upon days, but Martha and Mary, the sisters of Lazarus, also live in Bethany. And so this was big news, this Jesus who could heal, this Jesus who could restore life, this Jesus who was amazing. And these children understood the power of the message of Jesus, and they were not ashamed. They announced his coming and going with excitement. They would shout the word Hosanna. Hosanna is not a word that we use much anymore. You don't see someone coming down the road and go, hey, Hosanna! You know, we just don't do that, but that word meant joy. That, that word meant praise. That word meant, I adore you. I give you my adoration. And so when they're yelling, Hosanna in the temple, it really, really, really ticked off the religious leaders. They didn't want to hear this. 
Jesus also recognized that this last week of his life was powerful, not just for the adults who would be hearing his teaching, but for the children who in a very short time would themselves be adults. And then their children would grow and 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 be adults at some point, and they're children's children. And so Jesus didn't just teach the adults. He was making sure that even the children were directed and, and that the children were learning. You see, we don't, we don't wait until a child turns 18 to teach them how to be a hard worker. We don't wait until a, a child is 18 to, te- to teach them to be dependable or trustworthy or honest. We began teaching our children from the get-go to be obedient, uh, to submit to authority, to understand the importance of truthfulness. We teach that from a very early age. And so these godly attributes that are placed within us from the time of our our infancy, we need to be making sure that we are magnifying and drawing those attributes out of our children, that our children are being taught not just how to read and how to write, not just being taught math and science, but that they are being taught about the godly characteristics that are already within them. So it becomes commonplace to them to be people who praise. Uh, Proverbs 22 says, Direct your children upon the right path, and when they are older, they will not leave it. You want to have adults who are praising Jesus, you don't begin in adulthood. You began with the children. That's why our children's ministry here at this church is so important. As you came in, there's a big board with, with all of the needs for children's ministry, and we have many. And, and if, if you would be willing to take part in helping train up a child, see Nash at the end of the service, but, but this importance of teaching our children empathy so that they, they can um, uh, relate to someone who's facing a challenge or, or a heartache. This desire to, to teach them truthfulness, honesty, all of those attributes. Um, but, but every now and then, there's, there's an adult who, who didn't get the teaching. It just, it just didn't happen. It's, it's difficult now, but not impossible, to learn the godly characteristics that should have been taught to us as a child. And if you're going, well, my parents didn't teach me that. They, they just didn't. It's not too late. And, and so we, we embrace the word of God and we trust that, that when we're out of line, God offers us the discipline that we need so that we can learn. I want to show you an example of discipline. In our own household, on uh, Sunday evenings, uh, our kids are always over and our grandkids are over. And sometimes there's mass hysteria at our house. And Sunday evening was no different. Last Sunday evening, they were, the grandkids were playing this new game. It's new to me, at least. It's called Among Us. It's a, it's a game that's a couple years old, and, and it's fairly easy and can be, um, uh, even the, the youngest of kids can learn how to play this. Um, you, you take the role of a spaceship crew. And you, you are depart, getting prepared for departure. But among you, hence the name of the game among us, is an alien invader. And this alien invader must be stopped or they will take down your crew. And so we, 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 I, we were listening to the kids and they're yelling, report, report. And then every now and then I look over there and one of them's laying dead on the ground. And um, I'm like, what are you guys doing? Uh, well, we're playing among us. There's an alien among us. And this is not new because a lot of times our children play, oh, this is horrible. I'm, I'm even embarrassed to say this. A lot of our children play bit by a poisonous snake. And so when they get bit by a poisonous snake, they fall dead. So we all know you just step over them and uh, they will be healed eventually when they get to the couch. So um, our kids are playing and we're just letting it go. But, but it had escalated and, and it, they, they were way too loud. And they were running like banshees Sunday night. And so um, I, I, I said, you must stop this. You can play the game, but you cannot run like this. You are going to break something. Or you're going to run into Grandma Lou and knock her over. And then you'll really be in trouble. So they got quiet and I was so happy, went back to the kitchen, finished finishing up on dinner. That lasted for about mm, 
five minutes. And then this happened. We are constantly aware of how important it is to teach our children. We're doing it all the time. Whether they're your children, whether they're your grandchildren, whether they're the neighbor children, we are doing this all of the time. And this importance, the most important thing we're going to do is teach our children about Jesus. We can't just teach them not to run in the house. We've got to teach them about Jesus. I heard a guy say the other day, the most important thing you're going to do is vote. Well, voting is important, but I'm going to tell you the most important thing you're going to do is train up a child in the way of the Lord. Nothing more important than that. Because, you see, what our children are watching, even strangers' children are watching as, as they look at adults. Is, is there evidence? Is there evidence that, that, that defines who they truly are? Because the way we act, my friends, the way we act is the evidence of who we really are. And if we are followers of Jesus Christ and we are claiming this title Christian, so then we ought to love what he loves. We ought to hate what he hates. And from a very early age, we need to be discerning God's will in our life as revealed through Scripture. But this is something that you have to learn. Whether you learn it as a child or whether you learn it as an adult, this is something we must learn. We must learn what, what are we commanded to do? What does Jesus say about how we should behave? We need to be teaching our children and hearing it ourselves that we are not to lie. We are not to cheat. We are not to steal. This, this week I, I dealt with, with somebody who was lying, just a liar, liar, pants on fire. And that is always irritating to me, especially when the liar, liar, pants on fire is talking about me. That's a problem. So we need to be teaching our children and ourselves. We do not lie. We do not cheat. We do not steal. We, we honor our mother and our father. No matter how old you are, you are to honor your mother and your father. We aren't to put anything before God. We aren't to make for ourselves graven images. We aren't to have these idols that we worship instead of him. We are not to be committing adultery. In other words, sex outside the boundaries of marriage. I know this isn't a popular topic, but the truth of the matter is sex outside the boundaries of marriage is adultery. And he says this is a no-no because what happens when we have sexual relations is we unite ourselves to one another and the two shall become one and, and you don't want to become one with all of these people. You know, it's not a good idea. It's just not good. God said don't do it. It is not good for you. We don't misuse his name. We don't, we don't take his name in vain. We do not murder. And we are to have a day of Sabbath rest every single week. Not just during the month of your vacation week. Every single week. We are to have a day of Sabbath rest. It's important for us as we connect and, and, and are strengthened through rest. See, if our children are going to learn these truths, if, if our children are going to live them out, they must see those truths in us, whether they are your children or someone else's child. When you go about your daily business, what do people see in you? Do they see Jesus in you? We have to be able to identify sin and know what it is if we are going to move from it. If we are going to walk away from it, if we're not going to choose it as an option, we have to know what is sinful. We're going to direct our children in the way that they should go. And when they are old, they're not going to depart from it because it is within them, even, even within them from the, the time of their birth. And so if we're going to share something 
We have to have it ourselves. Perfect illustration if you can't give away something that you don't already own would, would fall into play with our Creole service. As soon as you guys all depart from here, um, we do a little straightening up, and then another group of people come in here, and they are part of our Creole service. And they don't speak English. Most of them don't speak any English at all. So it would be like me telling you, hey, I'm going to teach you how, to, how to, uh, to speak Creole so you can come to the Creole service and connect with our Creole family. But I don't know a single word. I struggle with the word hello. And so um, how can I teach you that language when I don't know it? Kind of like a light bulb moment, isn't it? Like, I can't teach something that I don't already own, that I don't already know. And as uh, our young Pastor Brinley would say, you never plug your ears when Jesus is talking. But part of her sermon, as Pastor Jason was listening to her, was she said, get your fingers out of your ears. I like that. Because the fingers that we as adults have in our ears, this plugging our ears so that we're not listening to Jesus, it's sin. See, sin will always keep us from being able to hear the words of Jesus. Anger, laziness, greed, gluttony, uh, sexual immorality, uh, a cynical heart. All of these things will keep us from hearing Jesus. Those are the things that plug our ears, sin. And, and if we are to stand before God and, and, and honor him with our life, we... we can't do it with our fingers in our ears. Have you ever talked to a child and they, they, they go, mm, I can't hear you, I can't hear you. If you're a parent, you've heard that. Or a spouse, because I think I've done that to Mike. But um, he, he said, Sunday morning, make sure you don't say you think you've done that. You need to admit you have done that. <laughs> Yeah, right. So, do you want to... <laughs> I can't remember. But um, <laughs> do you want to stand before God in that posture? I can't hear you. I can't hear you. I can't hear you. I'm, I'm, I'm going to do what I want to do. I can't hear you. Get your fingers out of your ears. That's what sin... Sin plugs your ears. Open a Bible. We're going to look at Colossians chapter 3, page 988. And um, this is where Paul is challenging these particular churches to put on their spiritual wardrobe. To, to make sure that they are armored up, so to speak. That they recognize what they are presenting to the world around them. And that they see who they truly are. And, and the, the, the example that they are setting, not just for children, but the example that they are setting to those who don't know the Lord. See, we're not, we're not just an example to children. We are an example to those who don't know the Lord. And so we want to make sure that, that, that when we... We say we are Christian. We resemble salt. Salt salt flavors the food. And in the absence of salt, you know it. A couple years ago, I made some cookie dough, and I realized I had forgotten the salt. And now the dough was all done, and I thought, you know, I don't know that I can incorporate the salt now. It's not going to work. Took a big old spoonful. The cookie dough tasted fine to me, so I thought, I'm mm, going to go ahead and bake it. So I went ahead and baked those cookies, and they were horrid, horrid. Had to throw them all out and the rest of the dough. The reason, just a teaspoon, just a teaspoon of salt would change that whole batch of cookies. Well, you see, as Christians, that's who we are. We are the salt of the earth. We should flavor the world around us. And a little bit of Jesus goes a long way. A little bit of Jesus flavors and changes everything. Thing. We ought to be like this sweet perfume, fragrant. When, when you walk in the room, you ought to, you ought to smell. It. When, when, if someone's wearing perfume, you, you know it. You, you, can, you can smell it, that fragrance. See, as Christians, people ought to be able to know when we are there because we make a difference because we react differently to the world. We don't just blend in with the world. We are different than the world. And we're okay with that because we're staying on mission. And it means that we are going to be different. If you just blend in with the world, then that means your testimony is probably lacking 
in, in this area of, of strength and power and truth of who Jesus Christ really is in your life. So here we are, verse 5. So put to death, to death. He didn't say just put it away. He didn't say just try to do your best. Kill it off. Kill it off. Put it to death. So put to death the sinful, earthly, lurking, the earthly things lurking within you. Have nothing to do with sexual immorality, impurity, lust, or evil desires. Don't be greedy. For a greedy person is an idolater, worshiping the things of this world. Because of these sins, the anger of God is coming upon you. You used to do these things when your life was still a part of this world. But now is the time to get rid of anger and rage and malice behavior and slander and dirty language. Don't lie to each other for you have stripped off your old sinful nature and all of its wicked deeds put on your new nature whether you are a child or whether you are an adult or whether you are somewhere in between when you claim Jesus Christ we are putting off the old and putting on the new that's that spiritual wardrobe I just talked about uh, verse 10, put on your new nature and be renewed as you learn to know your creator and you become like him. In this new life, it doesn't matter if you are a Jew or a Gentile, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbaric, uncivilized, slave or free. In other words, it does not matter who you are, where you've been, what you've done. Christ died for you since God chose you to be the holy people that he loves you must clothe yourself with tender-hearted mercy kindness humility gentleness and patience patience clothe yourself with these kind of things Paul was saying hey church wake up you are calling yourselves followers of Jesus. Follow well, no matter who you are, whether you are a child or whether you are an adult. He wants them to adopt this mindset, this powerful mindset that Jesus didn't just die to forgive your sins. He didn't just die to forgive your sins. If this is the only thing you remember this morning about don't plug your ears, don't miss this fact. Unplug your ears and hear Jesus didn't just die so that your sins could be forgiven. Jesus died so the power of sin could be removed from you. So that sin no longer holds you down sin doesn't own you and this is how you know that that the power of sin no longer reigns as as the king of your life it doesn't mean that you're never going to mess up again it doesn't mean that you're never going to sin again but it does mean that the instant that you do you recognize it that the moment that you say or do or are involved in something that you know you should not be. You've unplugged your ears and you know that that is sin. You identify that moment as sin. You feel it within your gut, within the, 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 your throat. This, this, you just know that this is wrong. That's, that's, that's the power of Jesus Christ releasing you from sin because now you can recognize it so quickly. And you can say, oh, Lord God, I'm so sorry I'm so sorry, I don't want to be identified that way. I don't want to be involved in that. I don't want to be that person. Forgive me, Lord. See, the minute that, that, that you sin and you recognize it, that means that the power of sin has been broken. He died to break the power of sin in your life. See, sin is the worst affliction you will ever experience. The worst affliction you will ever experience. It's worse than any illness, any heartache, any sorrow, any grief. It will, cause, it will cause you more displeasure than anything else in this world. Sin is the greatest complicator you will ever experience. It complicates relationships. It, it takes down marriages. Sin impedes our ability to see what is right. Sin 
impedes our ability to do what is right. It is, it is the greatest burden you will ever be under because it, it will rob you of your joy. It will murder your happiness. It will hinder your sense of peace and, and comfort. And, and, and the worst part is it keeps you from fellowship with God. Sin separates you from God and it keeps you from being in fellowship with him. It's as if you have plugged your ears to that still small voice. So, this week, I want you thinking about all of the things in your life. And I want you asking, are there times you're standing before your creator who placed within you before your birth the desire to serve him, to know him, to love him? Are you standing before him saying, mm, I can't hear you. I can't hear you. Are you plugging your ears while Jesus is talking? And I pray that the answer is absolutely not. Stand with me.